What's up, everyone? By now, you know we have partnered with the great people from Cut, the social betting platform. Cut is a peer-to-peer -peer betting platform that allows you to bet directly against all your buds and all the other Canes fans out there. That's right. You can join us on the Real Ones Canes podcast, a.k.a. Believe Miami, on Cut Today and bet directly against me, against Brandon, against anybody on your favorite sports, entertainment, pop culture, politics, whatever you want. Cut makes it so easy. Cut is the ultimate put-your-money-where-your-mouth-is platform, and it's legal right here in Florida and probably where you are, too. Be sure to follow at Cut bet on all your social media channels and download the app via the app store or at cut.com. Use code believe B L E A V Miami. That's believe Miami for a 10% deposit bonus. It's cut and it's freaking awesome. What's up, everyone, and welcome to the Real Ones Canes podcast. I'm the Beast, Brian London. He is Brandon O'Doy. You can follow him at Brandon underscore O'Doy. Follow me at Miami Radio Beast. And go subscribe to the podcast wherever you get the podcast. If you are watching this on the YouTube, which we thank you, also go subscribe to the audio edition of it. Why not? Just go, just go, go subscribe wherever you get it. Apple, Amazon, Spotify, you know the places. Go subscribe to the podcast. Brandon, uh, uh, it's another week of spring practice. I think they just finished practice number 11. Um, and then this weekend, they'll work on some situational stuff. And then um, sooner, sooner, it's it's coming real soon, is the spring game being held on campus at Cobb Stadium, which is interesting. And we'll get a chance to see uh, a little bit more of, of this team. It'll be vanilla, but we'll, we'll get to see some 11-on-11 uh, 11 11 action in the spring game. So that'll be good. But a couple of interesting things um that i want to talk to you about and this is actually we'll start in a bizarre place because it just happened to catch my my eyes before we came on here i was looking at who was coming in on some recruiting visits and they got guys from you know georgia alabama tennessee the deep south um coming in on some visits and they're still pushing they're still pushing hard in south florida but I find it interesting because historically, the University of Miami, right, it's been Florida, it's been Texas, it's been California, and then, you know, a few spots in between. But now they really have this focus on some of the areas back where you grew up, you know, in Georgia, plus Tennessee and Alabama. I, I just find it an interesting kind of spot for the University of Miami to recruit in. I just, do you, like, what are your, what are your thoughts when you, when you see more and more guys are coming in for some of these deep South locations, kind of what I kind of just was like, Oh, that's sec country. Why are we even attempting at that sort of thing? Well, one of the first things you got to understand beast is this is a very weak class for 2025. Um, this current rising senior class in South Florida, you don't have a lot of elite level guys uh, that you really have to have in this class if you're Mario Cristobal in this Miami Hurricanes football program. So when you circle the wagon on a few targets, some guys that you think, hey, maybe these are pieces that we got to have. They're local. Uh, they give us sort of the flavor of the 305 and the 954, the 561 on what we were built on. And then after we deal with that, we're going to have to go somewhere and create a stabilization for this team. And Miami has done a decent job in the past several years getting into the Metro Atlanta market. And that is a market that is bereft with talent. And one of the main reasons is because it's so expensive to live in South Florida, you have a lot of kids who move up to Georgia uh, some at some point in their middle school to high school careers. Perfect examples of that. Travis Hunter, he's from Boynton Beach. Uh, he moves to Collins Hill and becomes one of the best players in the country, the number one player, but he's right here from South Florida. You have Cedric, um, uh, who plays at Texas. He he, he played a lot uh, of football for them. I can't think of his last name off the top of my head, but he starts at Texas, and this is a kid also from Boynton Beach, and he moves up to Orlando Edgewater. So talent moves around, and a lot of it you know, kind of originates from the 305, but when you don't have – what it is that you need, be you know, Miami is for all intents and purposes a national recruiting powerhouse at this point because one, you've got to win, two, you've got NIL pretty much down and covered. You one of the first to kind of perfect that, and three, you know, the local talent this year is not as strong as it needs to be. 
uh, to, to kind of put you where you need to be as a program. Now, that's in great juxtaposition to last year's class, the 2024 class, which had talent by the boatloads. The number one player in the country was Jeremiah Smith from South Florida. One of the top recruits that Miami did land was Josiah Trader, who's the number one you know receiver target uh, behind Smith. And so you kind of go after four guys from St. Thomas Aquinas, you grab a couple of other guys from different places and you build your class around the South Florida base. But you can't do that every single year, especially when the talent is as thin as it is in this class. I think you're going to see Miami go after uh, Randy Akari at Miami Central. He's a 6'4 defensive tackle. They may take a commitment uh, from Ezekiel Marcelin, who's sort of an undersized Mike linebacker. Uh, but he'll need to, you know, kind of do everything right in the process leading up to that. Thursday's practice, today's practice was a practice where they wanted to bring all the long and local uh, big edge rushing guys. They brought in uh, uh, Brandon Thomas, who's a transfer from Virginia to Carroll City. Uh, they brought in uh, Williston Telemac and, and guys like that that are not necessarily takes at this very moment. But they're guys they want to kind of keep around, watch them continue to develop and see how their board goes, because you never know what's going to end up uh, in fall. And you may be able to get a hometown discount with some of the kids in your backyard. You know, there are targets locally here and, and they consist of primarily people like Cortez Mills, the wide receiver down at Homestead, the very dynamic young man. Uh, guys like Bryce Fitzgerald at Miami Columbus, coaches alma mater, and, and guys like that. But it is not a must-have, must-do for, I would say, uh, the base of the class, which you're used to seeing 25% of the guys, beast come from South Florida. So you're seeing that dip into the Atlanta area. You're seeing that dip into the Deep South. And that has to happen in this class. And, and this is a huge recruiting weekend for the University of Miami. And if you've been paying attention online to Twitter, and even if you haven't, you're you're logged into the podcast, I can tell you this is one of the most important uh, weekends recruiting-wise for this 2025 Miami Hurricanes recruiting um, class because you need to be able to try to figure in and, and laser focus on guys that you're going to go after because the boards are starting to fall. Guys are starting to commit, and some of the really – Big time talents are already off the board and you got to try to figure out how to get these guys into your class, get them committed, get their NIL negotiated and try to hold on to them with a really good season. And then some of that low hanging fruit, when you go out and win 10, 11 games, if you can manage that, you want to try to grab some of that stuff at the end uh, to be able to round this class out. So, I mean, it's so weird to me that it's, you know, we're in early April. And you're talking about this being a huge recruiting weekend for the 2025 kids. It it boggles my mind, but it just goes to show you how early you have to get on these kids and make roster decisions, basically. I mean, you personnel management, roster management is huge when it comes to this stuff as you're projecting out the different recruiting classes. Absolutely. Because, see, you got to go ahead and lock these guys down and you got to be prepared for 2026 which is a big time. South Florida comes back in a major way where you got Dia Bell, American Heritage quarterback. You've got CJ, um, Calvin Russell at Miami Northwestern, big 6'5 wide receiver. You got guys like Javari Flowers, who's a 10 4 track guy, uh, a defensive back at Miami Northwestern. So you've got to go ahead and lock these types of things down and then get prepared for 26, where you've got to commit from Jordan Campbell, a 6'2 wide receiver. You've got to commit. From six one or six foot Malachi um, uh, Nelson, as far as is it, is it, he's concerned it, at the American Heritage, and he's one of Malachi Tony rather. Uh, the Malachi's are all blending together from all the recruiting talk. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, the the recruiting calendars have been pushed up from what you traditionally know. And I don't, I know you don't cover it, you know, as extensively. I don't really cover it. I just happen to know. Uh, because of you know the business of moving kids around and helping kids to get into school, uh, which is something I engage in, you've got to know that right now you want to get those guys on official visits. You want to get them locking things down and possibly committed before you leave the summer and go into fall camp. Because once you get into fall camp, you're going to shut things down and go into a closet and try to come out and be ready to go and fire on all cylinders in Gainesville 
uh, on the 31st of August. And so, and there's no let up. You get that first opening big time game, probably on national television, tremendous implications on both sides. And then you have, you play a very talented FAMU team, you know, that was an FC, FCS national, HBCU national champion, uh, you know, very talented team. They're going to lose a lot of pieces and they have a new coach, uh, but they're still going to be, you know, no slouch. It's not going to be the Bethune Cookman game that you've seen the previous couple of years. This game is going to be a game where you're going to have to come to play. You got some other, you know, interesting non-conference games, South Florida, uh, very trappish. So you, you, you have to kind of segment how you recruit and focus on things so that you can pay attention to what matters. And oh, by the way, the portal is going to open next week. And so you have to be cognizant of where your energy lies, because once that happens, you're going to want to start hosting those portal kids and get them on campus as well. Speaking of the portal, we have to have a blunt conversation and maybe it'll be uncomfortable because um, we don't know, you know what we don't know. But I was listening to Mario Cristobal address the media earlier today and asked him about the quarterback situation. He talked about the loaded room and Cam Ward. And obviously, and he's and he, and he very, he said, listen, Cam number one, Reese number two, Emery number three. Oh, yeah. Then there's Drew Curry. And I was, I kind of was like, what? And we have that portal opening. And I, you know, we all kind of fell in love with Jakari at the end of the year. He, he played in that bowl game. I thought he did a good job. I love the young man's attitude. Uh, I love his skill set. Um, and I just wonder if in a couple of weeks we're going to be looking at the portal and be like, oh, there, we let one go. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a pipe dream to think that we're going to hold on to, you know, four really talented starting capable quarterbacks. And you don't want that. I mean, that's not good for this program because, you know, you're going to keep people from wanting to come in. You know, Miami has a, a really good 2025 quarterback out of the Atlanta area, a state champion in Luke Nichols. You don't want to keep, you know, that room completely packed. You want to give a guy an opportunity to feel like he has a chance to play here. So I'm sure Cam and Reese aren't going anywhere. And I think when Emory got back faster than most people expected, you know, because he looks like a guy that's not really been injured, you know, in the limited time I've gotten a chance to see him in reps at practice. Um, I think the odd man out is Jacuri. And then those comments on the podcast, I don't know if that won him any, you know, fans in the coaching staff. And it just may be time for him uh, to move on to greener pastures and uh, to get out and actually be a full-time starter. Now, I will say this. In the portal era, everybody's a one-year player. A guy like that could be told, hey, look, man, you see the boy. It's Cam and Reese. But, you know, things can happen, man. Go somewhere, play, and, hey, who knows? We might come calling and knocking on your door. We know you love being a hurricane because you had opportunities to leave and and we're basically not allowed to play all last year. And you took it on the chin and, and you know, you were a good sport about it, or at least publicly he was. And so, um, yeah, don't, 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 don't stay too far away from your phone, Mr. Brown. Uh, now we're getting into a, a European soccer loan situation where a guy's going to go play for another program hey. and, and then come back. Hey, listen, Mario Cristobal has a lot of friends in college football. Do not, do not be surprised because one thing's for sure, Cam is gone after this year. He's a one-year rental, okay? If something doesn't go right with Reese, you could be right back where we were heading into the bowl game against Rutgers less than a year from now. So, hey, don't, 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 don't. Yeah, we feel great about the quarterback room, but it only takes one injury. One guy's already gone. And if anybody else gets injured, beast, this could be interesting. So, you know, you never burn bridges. This is a one-year situation, especially with the quarterback position. The portal makes everything year to year. We don't know who's going to be where until the roster's locked in the fall. And that's how it goes. So you just have to be very nice, very cordial, because I'm telling you, this guy has Heisman potential, and I'm not saying he's going to be that, 
but he's not a guy I would bet against. And, and that's for sure. Yeah, for sure. So we saw Akeem Mesidor finally start to come back a little bit. I didn't know this, man. He had two foot in, uh, foot injury on each foot, ligament damage, both feet. Tough, tough road back, man. But he's finally getting back. He's a player that we really were counting on to be a huge part of that Miami defensive uh, line rush last year. He's finally starting to move his way back in. That's good for everybody. He talked about, you know, loving to play next to Ruben Bain, who's back himself for being nicked up. But Akeem Mesidor starting to get back in the mix. Hopefully he's healthy for the season. That's good for this team. Uh, and I, I, I kind of like what I see as some of the options we have at defensive line, some of the transfers that have come in, you know, Marley Cook and, and what have you in the middle, but, uh, you know, Nigel Leak and Akeem and Ruben and Harrison Hunt and these guys, um, I think are really turning into a good unit. I don't think Nigel Lee Kelly will be on this team in the fall. Uh, oh. if he, if he is, uh, he's not going to be on there for long. Um, they took four. Starters. They took four starting caliber guys in this last recruiting class. You got Armando Blunt. Um, you got the guy from Tampa Warden. Uh, you got another guy from Chicago at defensive end. You already had Jaden Wayne who played. He wasn't yep. injured. Not just he had an injury. He's coming back from that. He may be the odd man out in this scenario. Um, and it's it's just it's 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 kind of a good news bad news because. Um, when he's when a guy like that is expendable, it's kind of like Henry Paris. It's like, man, you were a good player, but you know, we're deep in there. Like, we ain't gonna cry. I mean, it just Jacuri potentially leaving. It's like I don't think any Canes fans are gonna shed tears. Hey, that's unfortunate. Would have loved it if he would stay, but I mean, he was the four string quarterback. And coach, if if coach is being honest with the media about it, where he stands, surely the kid knows that, you know, he's not where he probably wants to be. And so this is sort of a return in certain areas. We're not fully all the way there from top to bottom on the roster, but this is sort of the return of the early 2000s where they're kind of literally three or four guys who could start, you know, in this program. And so this is not the time to be the odd man out because you could be looking uh, at the front door. And so at the end of the day, um, Canes fans are going to have to grow through this transition of becoming deeper on a roster, and they're going to have to mature and, and be okay with guys, you know, going on to play. Now, I will tell you, where they go and what's said when they go there will show you all of the things you could not see. Now, I didn't need people at Wisconsin to write and say that Tyler Van Dyke wasn't as strong a leader as maybe they wanted him to be. We saw that. I knew you'd we, find that. We, we, Oh, of course, of course. And I can't wait for the season <laughs> to, to talk about one of your favorite positions on this offense. But I'm telling you, like, you cannot as a senior come in and say, oh, maybe I wasn't as prepared. Football doesn't mean as much to that young man. And it shows because what happened. If, if I were Tyler, I would either retire, declare for the draft, not get picked up. Or go to a lower level program because, man, he keeps going to these programs with big fan bases and guys that want him to be all in and his heart's just not in it. And you can't be having leadership concerns in your last year of eligibility. That's just not <laughs> – that's crazy to, to say it as politely as I can. Yeah, the juxtaposition between Tyler and what they're saying about him going to Wisconsin and Cam Ward and what they're saying about him coming to Miami, leadership and – all of those things. Yeah, they're talking about him as a first round. Yeah. That's a great uh, trade. Legit. Yeah. So we got a chance. Uh, I got a chance to to hear JoJo Trader uh, talk before to the media. And he brought up something which was really and – and people were asking him, hey, you talk to your boys that have gone to other schools that have enrolled, and what's the biggest difference that they're talking to you about high school to college? And he said time management, time management, time management. He's like, you just – it's not the same when you're going to, you know, high school as it is college. And now you're in a dorm and you got to wake up at a certain time. You got to be 10 minutes early to a meeting. You got to be 10 minutes early to practice. You got to be here. You got to be there. You got to go to class. You got to do all this stuff. You got to be an adult. Um, you're someone that works with a lot of young people. Um, and we don't, you know, we sit here and we talk a lot about the stuff that's on the field, but the off the field transition from high school to college 
is such a huge one. It was for me, and I didn't have football practice to to deal with. So I just wondering yeah. as you're as you're as you're you know going on your college road tour and you're talking to high school kids, uh, do do they understand what it what it kind of takes to make it up to the next level, time management wise, and all that stuff? No. no, they don't understand. But that's one of the good things about taking kids on these tours is, and, and Josiah was on a tour with me through Texas, uh, you know, so. We spent five days in the car together, so I know him pretty well. At, at the end of the day, um, you know, he's coming from a very structured Shaman Madonna program out of Hollywood, Florida. And for him to say, hey, look, I'm checking in with, you know, C.J. Bailey. I'm checking in with, you know, Jeremiah Smith at Ohio State, C.J. Bailey at NC State. I'm checking in with Davion Goss at North Carolina. And, and we're all early enrolled and we're already doing this college thing. And we're all talking about, man, it's kind of difficult to be in all the meetings we have to be in, uh, to be at trainings, to, to, to be at workouts, to be at practice, uh, to be at recovery, you know, the training table, wherever you're supposed to be as a college football athlete. And, and no, to answer your question, no, these high school kids who are aspiring to be college football athletes have no idea what it takes to, to be at the next level. And that's one of the reasons we do the tours, piece, because People think it's just easy. You turn on television, the guy is playing. They have no idea. There are guys that I go to visit at some of these colleges, and I've known them intimately growing up here in South Florida. And, you know, they look like a deer in headlights just trying to figure things out. We know guys that looked great in high school, and they go down to Miami, and they just never – they can never get it together. And, and it doesn't take but one or two things that you do wrong that can put you in a doghouse, and sometimes you can't get out of it. No matter your best intentions, thank God now there's a transfer portal where you can go try to get a new set of eyes on your talent and, and kind of start all over. But it used to be if you made mistakes that cost you your career, you were late consistently to meetings. If you were showing up and, and not being a program guy, you know what I mean? It's going to be a situation where, you know, it could potentially cost you, you know, a career. And so what JoJo is is talking about, what he's expressing is something very uh, similar to what all freshmen experience in college football, it is not easy. And he, listen, they went to college prepared. They're some of the best athletes in the freshman class throughout the entire country. So if they're saying, oh, it's kind of tough to do A, B, and C, imagine what the guy who was, you know, half as talented as him is going through because not only is he trying to figure that out, he's also trying to figure out how in the world to make an impact, you know, on good teams. So, you know, these are trying times for freshmen, but uh, from all, all, all told, it, it sounds like Josiah is going to be a guy that contributes. And that's a big deal because, you know, this receiving core could use some playmakers. And we know what we're going to expect out of Xavier Restrepo. Um, we think we have an idea with Jacoby George, and we're not sure about who's next. And so he's got to be one of those who's next guys this year. All right. We're going to take a break. On the other side, uh, I, I want to bring something up. You actually, We actually touched on it on a previous episode, you actually said something and it caught my mind. I've been thinking about it. And then I'm reading a news story that just broke before we, we came on the air. And, and this is going to be a surprise to you. We'll, we'll, we'll get to it. But, and what I'm talking about is Dan Radakovich, the University of Miami athletic director, and the decision he has to make in a very important one as to who will replace Katie Myers, the UM women's basketball coach. And they have kind of their sights set on someone, and I don't think it's who we thought it was going to be. We will uh, discuss that and more on the other side. It's the Real Ones Canes podcast. Subscribe wherever you get your podcast. We'll be back right after this. Hey, Canes fans. So since we recorded this podcast, the University of Miami has made a hire for their women's basketball coaching position not the gentleman from Fort Myers and Florida Gulf Coast, but Trisha Cullop, who was the uh, the head coach at Toledo. And uh, Cullop comes to Miami with a career record of 476 and 279 over uh, 24 seasons. She's coached for 11 years at Toledo. Before that, she was at Evansville for a year. She's had 10, 21 seasons, uh, two NCAA tournament runs, and uh, the six-time MAC. Coach of the Year. So there's that. Um, and what I'm about to play is our segment we recorded yesterday when we thought it was going to be the guy from Florida Gulf Coast. 
but the opinions still apply. I, I, I'm not sure I understand this higher um, for a multitude of reasons that we're about to get into when we didn't even know this was going to be the coach, but you understand. So check it out. Welcome back to the Real Ones Canes podcast. He is Brandon O'Doy. I am Brian London. Follow him at Brandon underscore O'Doy. Follow me at Miami Radio Beast. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast wherever you get the podcast. It's it's vitally, vitally, vitally important that you do that. All right. For a second, listen, women's basketball right now is huge. Brandon, I don't know if you watched the other night, Caitlin Clark, Angel Reese. That game was one of the highest sporting events that has occurred in a long time. It basically, other than like the Super Bowl, the SEC championship, the National College championship game, it was like the highest rated sporting event of the last 365 days. Unbelievable. I'll tell you what, I watched more women's basketball this year than I did men's basketball. Um, it's just it's just so fun to watch. And they played a high level. That game was frenetic. It was great. And I can't wait till these teams play this weekend in the Final Four, the championship, the whole thing. But women's college basketball is huge, which means that the retirement of Katie Meyer has a huge impact on the, yeah. the future of the University of Miami athletic program. Dan Radakovich, the, the uh, director of athletics at the University of Miami, has a huge decision to make with who he puts uh, or hires in that job. And all of a sudden, before we're, we're taping today and it's Thursday afternoon, uh, and all of a sudden, the story breaks, written by the great Michelle Kaufman, who does a great job for the Miami Herald, that pretty much it looks like the top target could be uh, the coach of Florida Gulf Coast, Carl Smesco. And, you know, he's been there for 22 years. He's got a 549 and 101 record. So he's got a good record. Uh, he's, you know, gone to the NCAA tournament a bunch of times. You know, he's got a good resume. But as we talked about, you know, whether it was last week or the week before, I'm not sure that's what you need right now at the head of your program if you're the University of Miami. I don't know that that's the direction they should be going in. Listen, 12.3 million people watched Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese go head to head. These are two of the most talented athletes in the entire country, regardless of gender, regardless of sport. These two teams played a game that was knockout drag out and really only got decided toward the end when Angel Reese fouled out and the game was pretty much over, but you had sort of, you know, a very sort of traditional um, old school Iowa team with just like a generational player in Caitlin Clark. And then you had sort of the new school, like very athletic, very, you know, swagooish type of LSU team. And, you know, these styles kind of, you know, were put and pitted together. But what you're going to notice is moving forward, there's more LSU type basketball than there's going to be Iowa type basketball. When, when Caitlin Clark leaves that Iowa program next year, you're not going to hear from them for a very long time. And those are facts. And you didn't hear from them before she got there. And so what I'm saying is the, 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 the Katie Meyer way of doing things, the Gino Ariema, uh, way of doing things, although shout out to him for finding a way with, you know, pr uh, arguably one of the better players in the country too with Paige Beckers. Though, that old school sort of Pat Summit way is kind of dying. And and everybody who has a coach like that is, is struggling. I mean, you look at Tennessee, they get rid of their coach who's off the Pat Summit tree. And all of these guys who've done it sort of this old school way enter in, you know, coaches like Don Staley who are coming in showing the, you know, the love of the culture, being super authentic, you know, recruiting these kids out of various backgrounds, no discrimination, whether it be from other countries, whether it be from various diverse backgrounds, whatever the case, but the common thread is super athletic, NIL, you know, centric, and, 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 and she's marketing these kids and allowing somebody is behind the scenes managing you know, the image of these young ladies. Let, let's be honest, like you used to, and this is sort of like from our generation, you can't really get away with this now, or this is sort of more looked down upon, but used to be the Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition used to be one of the most popular editions. So let's face it, and I think this is super safe to say, you know, young women who are, you know, sure of themselves going out performing 
it's good for the brand and it's embraced by the American culture. You bring in someone who's an old school sort of traditional way of doing things, suicides. If you don't do well, you miss a shot, you miss an assignment, you're coming out of the game type person. Like <laughs> that's not where Miami needs to go. This is a perfect time to think outside of the box, go grab one of these young uh, coaches like a Tamika Reed at Jackson State. You know, you, you look at the hires that they were just the, the last couple of years, the hires that are really splashed. It's been African-American women. Now, I'm not saying this because I'm black. I'm saying this because there's got to be a trend that's taking place. It's the same reason you're seeing more black coaches hired in college football than you've seen, because as NIL gets introduced, you know, um, a Nick Saban doesn't have the same leverage over Calvin Ridley that he used to because he walks in the gate, man, I'm making the same money that you're making. Like uh, you, you can't just tell me what to do. You've got to be able to relate to me human to human. You know what I mean? And so these relatability factors are, are, are created by how these kids are being raised. Now the culture is what I've you know kind of alluded to in so many ways. And you've got to have a coach that plays to that. If you want to be in this conversation, Miami is, is, is a great destination for a young coach, a great recruiting destination. One of the best places for college basketball, the women's basketball is right up the road in Orlando and Mount Verde Academy. But you don't see very many of those kids coming to play at the University of Miami for the women's basketball program. You can't go grab someone who's been on the West Coast of Florida, who's been around, you know, since I was in high school um, and, uh, think that they're going to come in and be what you need. Unless you're saying, Dan Redakovich, I don't have the money because it's all going to football or it's all going to rebuilding men's basketball and, and trying to spin, you know, Coach Larinaga out of this, you know, hole he's dug himself into. I don't know what the, 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 the strategy behind it is, but I'm out on it. I'm out on it. And what you're going to do is you're going to dig a hole for this program at the wrong time. And while you got, while you're doing that, NC State's playing for a Final Four. Duke was in the Elite Eight. You know what I'm saying? And, and some of these other ACC teams are really building up. So where do you want to be, Dan? And, and, and oh, by the way, baseball's not looking that good. We're really not confident in some of the things you've done because you do all of this beating these ranked teams on the weekend, and then you go in the week and you start losing to FIU and FAU. And those are unacceptable things because of the caliber and the culture that you built at the University of Miami. So, Dan, I got a lot of questions for you, Mr. Radakovich. And um, the way you're going with this hire, um, I want to caution you. You pay, you're paid a lot of money to make these decisions. And, yeah, you build nice, pretty buildings. But you need to start thinking about the future. And you need to start turning on the television and seeing the lineups that are happening that are bringing Thousands and thousands of dollars. Can you imagine if the University of Miami had a dominant women's basketball program and was oh. filling every single night, had a Caitlin Clark or an Angel Reese and the media that we have in this, you know, top 10 market in the United States? Dan, you can solve a lot of money problems here. Get a young, energetic, recruit first, culture specific coach with some NIL focus and let's make some money. And let's make no mistake about the metro area that we were, but that we are in, right? South Florida is vibrant, right? It's it's uh, forward leaning. It is you know future looking. It is uh, excitement. It is all that stuff, and it kind of matches what you're talking about as far as the new athletes, right? And it would make sense that you would want to hire someone that can take a hold of it all and use it to your advantage. Listen, I don't know about this guy at Florida Gulf Coast. He could be a great coach. But in my mind, when I'm logically looking at it, that doesn't seem like the right direction to go in. Uh, not what he got when you got all these factors. And you are so totally right. Look at the economics of it. You get the right coach and the right players playing. Look what You could have what LSU has. You could have what South Carolina has. You could have what USC had. You could have this stuff if you do it the right way. And I don't yeah, know that this is the right way. I don't. I, I hate to. I hate to second guess the pick before it even gets in, but um, I'm second guessing. You know what? Um, I've never heard you second guess anything. So that's you know. 
<laughs> All right, dude. Um, we're inching closer to the spring game. We'll have a kind of a preview next week, and then we'll go through it. We'll see what happens, and uh, you know, we'll we'll get here, and then the portal's opening, and we'll have to cover all of that. We'll get some 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 guys that we know out. We'll get some new guys in. It'll be an interesting situation. So uh, we got a lot to get to here. It may be the off season technically, but there is no off season, so we will do that. Uh, Brandon, I appreciate you, my friend, um, and we will see you next time. It's a real one, Kane's podcast. Peace.